Well, when I took a look into it, you find out real quick that that relationship doesn't hold. Uh, Arguments that don't have really rational, physical um, logic. And that the climate system does not respond to warming episodes the way the IPCC models think they are. Now remember this conclusion that most of the warming in the last 50 years was due to greenhouse gases is a model-based conclusion. Your Lomborg says it well. We didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones, and we won't leave the fossil fuel age because we run out of fossil fuel. Let me begin by thanking the bipartisan group of U.S. governors who convened this meeting. Few challenges facing America and the world are more urgent than combating climate change. The science is beyond dispute and the facts are clear. Planet Earth is in trouble. On average we'll see at least two, quite possibly as much as three and a half degrees centigrade rise in temperature in the next hundred years. The impact of climate change can be seen around the globe. It's happening now, and hundreds of millions of people are already suffering the consequences. Another concern, more severe natural disasters. An increasing level of awareness is building among all stakeholders in the region about the significance of climate change. Global warming seems to be everywhere you look, in the news, movies, politics, and all over the internet. Since the beginning of time, humankind has been fascinated with the climate. Weather may have meant the difference between life and death. Ever since the first civilizations, humans have prayed to the deities for a good harvest. Some cultures performed rain-making rituals, while others offered sacrifices. But now, in the 21st century, we are looking to science to help us change our climate before it's too late. prepare for the worst and hope for the best. The climate scientists like myself were saying climate warming is real. Uh, humans are the single most important factor and uh, you know we got to get our, our, our act together on this issue. The theory of man-made CO2 leading to global climate change is a hoax. Part of the problem is global warming is almost a misnomer. It, it's more like climate chaos okay. and that heating up the planet could actually freeze parts of the planet. So, uh, I mean, there's an ongoing debate, really. There are many opposing views about global warming. Everyone agrees that the climate is changing, but the question is, what effect does mankind have? Here is a simple single variable model where you have an increase in CO2 leading to an increase in temperature. Well, when I took a look into it, you find out real quick that that relationship doesn't hold. Uh, in, in a time series model like, like this is, the cause always has to lead the effect. You smoke and then you develop lung cancer. Well, what you find with this CO2 and temperature, temperature leads CO2, not vice versa. So the model that they're, they're supporting is that lung cancer causes smoking. They have their independent dependent variable reversed. Dr. Wagner's skepticism led him into further research on the subject. He formulated his ideas into a presentation and decided to hit the road. If you haven't seen this event before, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering um, the global warming science. My presentation is a scientific review that brings the necessary skepticism to this field of science. Um, I know that many scientists say that this is settled, 
uh, but I just simply disagree. So I've seen uh, Robert Wagner's mm -hmm. uh, presentation and I was struck after not very long into it that he didn't seem to understand some fundamentals of atmospheric science upon which he, he builds arguments that don't have really rational physical um, logic behind them. One of the critical flaws of the theory is that temperature leads CO2, not vice versa. One of the other myths perpetuated by the global warming believers is that the Mount Kilimanjaro glacier is melting. Uh, Mount Kilimanjaro is at 17,340 feet. It never gets above freezing. The ground measurements have all sorts of problems with them. Uh, one of the main problems is where they locate them. Some are located at the ends of runways of, air, of uh, airports. The other ones are located in parks above grills. He's making numerous logical mistakes and and he believes them too like he you know he clearly um thinks that he's right but what i'm noticing is he's being very selective and and choosing only arguments that support um his contrarian position it's kind of dishonest in showing only selected information not the whole picture i'm taking their data that they publish taking it to a live audience and allow the audience to do their own period. Hey, oh, let me tell you, okay, this is kind of like Jeopardy. If you've seen this presentation before, don't blurt out the answer, all right? <laughs> so what is number five? It's the most significant greenhouse gas. What is it? H2O. Water vapor. Or, John, you know, how do you say it? Not water vapor, water gas. All right, how many people knew water gas was the most significant greenhouse gas? If you take the climate models, they ignore the most significant variables. They ignore water vapor, they ignore the sun, and they immediately focus in on um, CO2, which uh, is a relatively insignificant greenhouse gas. His attempts to disprove uh, humans warming climate theory fail. They, they don't hold water. There are, however, scientists that question man's influence on climate change. Now remember this conclusion that most of the warming in the last 50 years was due to greenhouse gases is a model-based conclusion. So it's a big question in my mind as to whether and how much humans are actually affecting the climate. I have been working on and off on the topic of uh, carbon dioxide, uh, the sun and the climate system for about 20 years now. and. Uh, I have reached a certain conclusion. Looking at it from uh, physics, the point of view of physics, chemistry, and biology, there's no way in the world that one can regard CO2 as any air pollutant. To the contrary, I think that having a lot more CO2 is a far more healthy things for the climate system and the environment and the ecology all by itself. When CO2 is increased, results are higher production and better plant quality. Plants must absorb carbon dioxide in combination with water, soil nutrients, and sunlight to produce the sugars vital for growth. Farmers are well aware that an increased CO2 level will improve crop yield. In fact, some farmers purchase a carbon dioxide generator for their greenhouses. They're, they're not um, arguments or science that is going through the, the independent peer review process and therefore it is not science. The key is they've rigged the peer review system to make sure that the people that will give them the answers that they want are on that peer review process. Uh, science isn't done by consensus, you know, it's just simply done by the facts. There's that famous quote by Albert Einstein, no amount of experimentation can prove me right. A single experiment can prove me wrong. It only took one experiment, Christopher Columbus sailing uh, um, around the world to prove that the earth wasn't flat. The relationship between CO2 and temperature is the basis of the global warming theory. Surprisingly, there is still considerable disagreement on this fundamental element. The temperature goes up before the sea sometimes goes that's, up. Sometimes that has been true in the past. The opposite has also been true in the past. Temperature rises on average about 800 years ahead of the carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide does not force the initial rise in temperature. This is being proved many times that CO2 causes temperature change and not the opposite. It doesn't make any sense that, that temperature will cause an increase in CO2. You will find that it is always the temperature change that is occurring, warming or cooling first, and then the CO, atmospheric CO2 response in a slight delay 
often by let's say a few hundred to few thousand years depends on the time period in the past um, co2 lagged temperature what's different about now is that um, CO2 is leading temperature. We're in a part of climate history. This is uncharted territory. CO2 used to be 7,000 parts per million, and temperatures never got above 22 degrees Celsius. Okay, we had a there's a period when CO2 is 4,000 parts per million, when we went into an ice age. Now put things in perspective, 4,000 parts per million led to an ice age. That's 10 times the atmospheric CO2 we have today. Chris Horner is a senior fellow and counsel for the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He was hired in 1997 by Enron to be director of federal government relations. My number one priority was to get a global warming treaty, they told me, and a cap and trade scheme domestically. They went around and bought companies that weren't really worth anything on the cheap. They bought the world's largest windmill company, it's now called GE Wind, and uh, they then set about working with green groups, working together to, in this case, scare the public into accepting a particular agenda, which was very costly and would never be accepted on its merits, and that was the global warming agenda. But that would uh, provide mandates and subsidies for Enron's wind interests, for their second largest in the world solar panel interest, that's now BP's. Uh, they're stuck with investments that otherwise won't make money without this scheme. It's not about the climate. And that's what I think people need to walk away from. If you can't ask your lawmaker, what will the temperature be after cap and trade? And if they can't tell you that it will be anything different than what it would otherwise be, you need to say, then why? What is your reason for imposing what would be the biggest tax increase in American history? We've only been measuring temperature for about 150 years with thermometers. So the scientists rely on proxy temperature data to tell us the temperature for the previous centuries. Proxy data includes tree rings and ice cores, among others. Um, the ice core the fact that the, the snow is deposited mm -hmm. in layers and that you can count the layers going back in time make it fairly easy to reconstruct uh, past climate. These proxy measurements show that there has been a cycle of warming and cooling. It's fairly well known the, that there have been a cycle of ice ages mm -hmm. and warm periods. So right now we live in a warm period. It's uh, We call it an interglacial period, so we're between a glacial climate. If you go back 200 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, you find that there are many times when the planet was warmer than it is today. And you'll find periods where change occurred in the global temperature as much as we see it doing today. The very foundation of global warming relies on accurate temperature data However, even this data is not without controversy. Once again, this gets back to data set construction. Once again, if you're going to do a good model, and you're going to do a model, let's say, with the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial, you have to have great integrity in that data. You know, if I run a model on the NASDAQ thinking it's the Dow Jones Industrial, I'm going to get some bad results. Well, if you take a look at where all this climate data comes from, uh, it is just rife with problems. There's an example out in California where you have basically two weather stations just a couple blocks apart, whereas one shows temperatures declining over the last 100 years, and another one showing sharp increases in temperature. Near the surface, we've had thermometers that have uh, resided in little shelters that people uh, read the temperature of. And for the past uh, 150 years or so, we've had those scattered around the country and around the world. There are a lot of problems with that kind of measurement because it's right near the ground, so it's affected by what's around it in the ground. So as through time, when surface development has gone along with farms or cities or buildings or so on, all of that affects that temperature measurement. NCDC has been exposed for not just locating but relocating thermometers to asphalt parking lots, black tar roofs, parking lots all over where engines can idle or cool right next to them over barbecue grills in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, and so on. Another issue with ground sensors is that they are not consistent over time. In this time-lapse video, you can see that weather stations around the world are being added, moved, or removed. A blue dot represents a station with complete record, and a red dot represents incomplete data for the given year. There's a video that we use in the presentation that shows the tracking of the weather stations over the last 150 years. And what you do, you see them clumped up in the U.S. 
And then as time goes by, they, they spread over into Europe, and then they spread down to South America. And yet, they're trying to, have, trying to claim that this 150-year data set is consistent. In 1990, a large number of the European ones drop back out again when Russia shuts down with the fall of the Berlin Wall. And so they're trying to say this, this data set is consistent, but clearly it's like taking the Dow Jones Industrial and having, in one year you have Microsoft, Intel, and, and Apple, and the next year you have Procter & Gamble, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and GM. Uh, their, their data sets are comparing apples and oranges, um, and so it's, it's kind of hard for you to say there's a lot of integrity in any of this data set. More recent technologies such as satellite temperature measurement are less prone to localized anomalies found in proxy data and surface temperature measurements. Now if you look from space and you look at the bulk of the atmosphere, and I'm talking about the air from say the surface to about um, 40,000 feet. With that, you have a better idea of uh, the global extent of any heating or cooling because you actually see the entire uh, planet with these polar orbiting satellites. As NASA scientists improve their understanding and predictions about climate change, NASA satellites provide critical data about what's happening on our planet today. With our satellite measurements over the past 30 years or so is a, an upward trend of global temperature of about 0.13 degrees per decade. This is not terribly remarkable, but it is upward. Uh, there are real large excursions year to year. 1998 was by far the warmest year. And since that time, the temperature really hasn't done much uh, to be excited about. We can claim since the end of the Little Ice Age it's warmed. <laughs> that's a fair assumption. I'm not sure that's a reason to panic. It's by definition. I think warmings follow cooling wash, rinse, repeat. There's many factors that influence climate. So increasing solar output warms the climate as, as has been presented. That's one factor. NASA gets a global view of three major pieces of the climate puzzle. How much of the sun's energy is hitting the Earth? How much of that energy is reflected back out into space? And how much is being trapped, heating the planet? So I do have some kind of a hypothesis, of course, that the sun is a very, very significant player. All right, well, here's an example of global warming. As you can see, the polar ice caps are, in fact, disappearing. But do I care? Absolutely not. Why? Because these polar ice caps are on Mars. And I don't think they have Martians are up there driving around in SUVs or have coal-burning power plants. In reality, what you see is that there's, there's evidence of global warming throughout the entire solar system. And what is the common denominator throughout the entire solar system? You got it, the sun. So more than likely, the global warming that we're experiencing is due to an increase in radiation from the sun not due to an increase in CO2. And few still doubt the impact of human influence over this predicted catastrophe. Those activities which are emitting carbon dioxide are obviously imposing a cost on the Earth, on humanity, on this generation and the next generation. The number of environmental refugees to more than 250 million people. The shortage of resources and the high number of refugees will increase tensions all over the world. The IPCC, or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is an international organization established in 1988, providing the world with the current state of climate change and potential consequences. The, the IPCC uh, says that the, the rise in temperature, which is associated with the rise in CO2, mm -hmm. uh, is due to human activity over the last 200 years. Original IPCC report, they have a chart that I use in the presentation that doesn't make the case for global warming. It shows that we are clearly not at the warmest temperature in the last 2,000 years. The next IPCC report, guess what? In an Orwellian fashion, that chart is pulled out and replaced by the hockey stick chart, which lo and behold shows basically no medieval warming period, no little ice age, and a spike in temperature in the last hundred years. And what's really interesting about that is the um, how he constructed it. Um, temperature data, um, as we know, I mean the thermometer was invented I believe in the 1500s. Dr. Mann doesn't include thermometer data until the early 1900s. I think he starts adding it in, in 1902. So the question should be, why wouldn't you include thermometer data prior to 1902? And what's even odder is, even when you have thermometer data, he's throwing in proxy data as well. And so it starts off prior to 1902, I believe, is all proxy data, which is you know, tree rings, coral, uh, ice cores, 
things like that, which, you know, if, if I was going to go measure the, the, the temperature outside, I wouldn't go poke a hole in a tree. I'd look at a thermometer. Well, he had thermometer data that he didn't use. He then throws in thermometer data with the proxy data, and the, the, star, the, the chart starts to dogleg. And then at the very end, after I think 1982, he drops off all the proxy data, then it springs up like this. What you're seeing there isn't a chart of global warming. What you see there is a, is a very poor data construction. The IPCC is working on their fifth assessment report, each of which is peer-reviewed and is widely considered to have scientific consensus. However, not all agree. Regarding the IPCC, I was a contributor in the 1992 and 95 reports. I was a lead author in 2001. In 2007, I was what's called a contributing author, which means I basically reviewed some sections of the IPCC. There was a consensus with the original chart, and the consensus remained with the new chart. Now, how in the world you can come up with two totally different data sets and maintain a consensus? That's a different question. Did you review it, and did they accept your review? And the answer to the second question is, by and large, the authors who are in charge, who were in charge of 2007, did not uh, accommodate the reviews and the recommendations I made. So I would say right off the bat then that IPCC does not represent the consensus of scientists since it tends to exclude those with whom it does not agree. Try to argue science by consensus, argue science by authority, argue science by prestige, which is all three of this is exactly the anti-scientific sentiment that I highly and dis disagree with. You know, that this, this is totally anti-science. You have to remember that freedom requires constant vigilance. Um, this climate issue is not going to go away. There's, there's just simply too much money in it. We're going to need to keep our eye on Washington and make sure that they know that we will not tolerate these type of policies being forced on the American public. In my pockets, I got holes in my jeans. My mama tried, but I could not be saved. If I could get away with breaking the law, I'd be a rich man without having Cap and trade was just one way of skinning the cat. It was not the only way, it was a means, not an end. Uh, and I'm going to be looking for other means to address this problem. You can say that the science is not settled, and it will never be, because there will always be something to learn. There are so many variables. In fact, we are still trying to understand. There are still many unanswered questions there, and that's legitimate. That's why I say the science is not settled in that sense, because there are still many things that we learn, and in fact, every day. Skepticism is, is a, a natural part of, of science, and, and, and science is a tool for knowing. Um, and, and so uh, it, it might get a little tense, you know, uh, but, but it's a way of kind of stoking the fire and, and making truth come out a little bit faster. We'll just try to stay alive. <laughs> and I do hope we can be friends. I certainly am not hostile towards anything that you're doing. Uh, and uh, I, I cannot thank this man enough. And Dr. S. and I, I'm uh, very glad you're here as well. You're crazy. We're just trying to stay alive and do the best I can for now.